welcome back to Artist Podcast. I'm Sarah. I'm an artist and registered dietitian, and I like to make stuff. So today I'm doing an odd combination, I guess. So the thing I'm working on today is I'm kind of circling back to something that I had started um, back in 2018. So I started working on like these sort of loose, fluffy molecule illustrations. And I've been also listening to Harry Potter audiobooks recently um, and re-listening to all of those. I actually didn't get into the audiobooks until much more recently um, and I'm enjoying them. It's many, many more hours worth of entertainment than watching the movies. While I was listening to those, I started to think about the paintings in Harry Potter. Um, so today I'm kind of combining I'm going to talk about Harry Potter and we're going to do some chemistry paintings. First off, just to kind of show you what um, I've done in the past. So, so this is, I don't remember exactly what lipid this is, but it's like a fatty acid chain with a double bond. So it has that bend in it. Um, and I did these back in June 2018, just kind of as a quick study. And so here's another one that's saturated. So there's no bends in it, no double bonds. And then this is some water molecules. So if you're listening to this, this is not very entertaining, but basically <laughs> I was doing these, um, I'm pretty sure I just used black acrylic paint and I kind of did like a dry brush technique with um, a fan brush. And I just went for like this really loose, um, wispy, scritchy scratchy sort of, um, paintings and then adding some like doing some almost like stippling with the paintbrush to add some some spots and like dots and such so I was kind of trying to get the feel of what I envision an atom or a molecule to look like um, just with the electrons moving around that it's um, chaotic and wispy and um, all over the place so I was kind of going for these like light fluffy looking um, chaotic little little molecules and um, was just doing these you know like I said quick studies a few years ago and I was experimenting with you know different brush speeds and techniques and moisture level of the paint um, this I started to do a looks like hydrophilic hydro I don't remember some manner of <laughs> I don't know what I was going for, um, but like a micelle or a liposome. I don't know. Where, I didn't finish it, so I don't know what I was getting into. This one, uh, the paint is looks like it was a little bit more moist, so the, the brush strokes are a little bit wider and a little darker. Those feel almost too heavy to me. I really like the, the first ones that I was holding up that have like that wispiness to them. And there's just a bunch of these. I don't need to show you every single one. It's kind of repetitive, but just... I'll go through them quickly just so I can get to the bottom of the pile. But yeah, I want to circle back to this and do a little bit more, kind of try to replicate it because it has been a few years since I did this. And so I just want to see if I can recreate that. These look like um, boobs, <laughs> but I don't mean it to. I think I was going for like just a two atom molecule. Uh, I don't know that I was doing anything specific, but okay. So that's all of the studies that I had done previously. And now that I'm to the bottom of my pile, <laughs> just hopefully that's mostly out of frame and you can't see the disaster pile that is to my right. Find an empty page here. And I had previously, like I said, did those with acrylic paint and today I want to try them with um, watercolors to see if that gives me that sort of light, airy texture and color. And I have these Marie's watercolors, just 18 watercolors. I got them for Christmas one year, many years ago, and I still have them because watercolor is probably one of my least favorite, probably one of my least favorite paints to work with. And uh, so it, it tends to last a while. Um, and rather than using black, I'm gonna use this blue, I think, if it'll come out. I'm just trying to find like a color that I have a lot of. I'd use purple because that one looks full, but it's dried out. And so, like I said, I wanted to talk about Harry Potter today because I, I realize this is not on topic as far as like nutrition, but I have interests outside of nutrition and art. Um, but I guess this is kind of like an art topic, but 
I wrote down a bunch of, of thoughts I had on this. So I was thinking, and it's possible that this was covered in, you know, JK Rowling's like later conversations, like deep dives about the Harry Potter world and whatnot. Um, I'm just talking today about some, you know, if you're a Harry Potter fan, uh, these this might be of interest to you. Um, just a fun conversation about a detail of, of Harry Potter. So I was thinking about specifically the portraits. And so I'm like, who, who paints those? So you know how they basically can talk and share their opinions and tell people, you know, it's like a, a living in a living being, um, just in a portrait form. So at what point do they come alive? Like, is there, I imagine there's probably an enchantment put on them after the portrait's completed, but it is it like, cause I don't know, like I said, I don't know if there's been more discussion or clarification on, on how the, the portraits work exactly. But you know, if you're midway through painting someone and they come alive and then they leave, like, how do you finish the portrait? <laughs> um, so like if you're working on a portrait of someone, at what point, like how distinct does the person have to be before they come alive? Or like I said, is there an enchantment put put on the painting after it's completed? So that's that's just one thing I was wondering about. Like if you're, you know, if you're a painter and you're painting someone and then they, you know, it gets distinct enough where it's like, okay, this is a person and then they start moving around or talking. It's like, how the hell do you finish the painting? Um, I'm just getting my paint sort of mixed. It's watercolor in tubes, so it's a little bit thick, especially because it's old. Um, and so I'm just reconstituting it and getting it to a consistency that I like. And now I'm hoping that I didn't dilute it too much. And I'm just using a, I guess this is a one inch. It's a number two, a number two fan brush. I don't know. Yeah, a number two. <laughs> so if you care, now you know. Um, so yeah, that's just the first thing I, I started thinking about. And then I was like, you know what, this might be an interesting podcast topic idea. So I sat down and started like thinking more in depth about the paintings. And so some of the other things I said, can portraits of living people talk? So if a living person has a painting done of them and that portrait is hung somewhere that it hears and sees a lot of people and learns about others, you know, it's like overhearing conversations. Will the living person also learn all that stuff or is the portrait a separate entity with its own brain? Like would the knowledge like transfer between them? And the same thing goes like if a portrait is done of someone who's living and the living person is living life and experiencing it away from their portrait, is that knowledge, that lived knowledge of the living person transferred to the portrait in real time or like after they die or um, are portraits generally not done of living people? Or are they only done of people who have passed away? So yeah, that's another thing I was wondering about. Um, I should actually try to paint. So hang on, <laughs> let me put a pause on that conversation. So, all right, this feels really, maybe it'll dry later, but it almost feels too, I'm trying to remember how I really did this. So if it was more chaotic. I also apologize, I'm not filming, but so you won't be able to see a close up this time, but that's okay. You'll live. It's not that interesting. It's a podcast. You're here to listen, not to watch. <laughs> I say like, hey, go watch the YouTube version all the time. Um, let's see. Because I, I remember kind of like keeping it central and then getting some swishes and then some random bits. I don't know if I like this particular brush or maybe I need to go bigger. I don't like that it's making this almost like cross hatching look to it. See, that's the thing that I liked about the acrylic paint. I think the acrylic paint with kind of like a dry brush technique, it kind of fragments the lines so they don't make all these like perfectly parallel lines. I don't want that. So watercolor might not be the way to go for this particular technique, which is, you know, good to know. Good to know, but we'll keep, we'll keep going and see. Maybe I'll take this brush and then it's saturated with paint. I'm describing this because I'm assuming there's gonna be some people who are just listening to this, but I'm taking my saturated number two brush and I'm wiping it on my dry number eight brush, also a fan brush. And we'll see if that'll be dry enough to kind of dry brush with watercolor. No, 
not really. <laughs> this is not going how I want. I think, I don't know, it might be the thing where I need to let it sit and then come back to it. I think because I'm trying to replicate something that I did several years ago with a different medium and lost muscle memory of that swishy technique that it's not giving me what I want. So yeah, that's the other thing. Like, are the Harry Potter portraits only of deceased people? And also, when did Dumbledore's portrait get done? Because it went from you know, he died and then at some point his portrait was hanging in the headmaster's office. So like who painted that and put it up there? And like I said, like when does it come alive? And it obviously has its own... Okay, so this this is the next thought I was going to say. So Dumbledore's portrait was able to give Snape instructions on getting the sword of Gryffindor to Harry and warning him that they may not take too kindly to Snape's presence since Snape had attacked George Weasley. So does Dumbledore's portrait, does the portrait of Dumbledore's like knowledge continue to grow after death? Since that was something that like the attack of Snape on George Weasley happened after Dumbledore died. Spoiler alert if you're not, <laughs> if you don't watch Harry Potter or haven't read the books. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the portrait would have had to been told about that happening after the fact. So I, I guess I was, I started to think like, wouldn't having a portrait of yourself be in some ways better than having a ghost? Because like the the ghosts, it's like a soul that stays on earth and they can float around and talk and, and whatever, but and you know, move around and stuff. But like portraits, they can still like eat and drink in their like portrait because if you remember the the fat lady as they call her in the book, um at on the the lady who's in front of the, the Gryffindor common room, she goes and gets like drunk with some of her friends in another portrait. And so you can still like eat and drink as a portrait. You can still learn, it seems. You can still give instructions. You can still talk to people. You can still remember memories. Um, the limitations being that you're stuck where your portrait is or you can, you know, flip back and forth between a portrait of you in one place to a portrait of you in another place. And where like... I don't know if it's the same for portraits anywhere, but if there's portraits near you, you can, you know, jump between them because, you know, like all the headmasters like ran down to see like what was going on and, you know, the people in the portraits can can move between Sir Cadigan, um, you know, running through the halls on his pony. <laughs> so I was just thinking like, it seems like the life of a portrait is better than being a ghost. So it's like you get to die, but then you also get to live. And then I was also thinking about... Like, how close do portraits need to be? Like, is the ability to jump from portrait to portrait in Hogwarts, is that limited to just how the enchantments are at Hogwarts? Or is that, like, the same for portraits in other households or whatever? So, like, how close do portraits have to be in order to jump between them? Like, could a portrait jump to a neighbor's portrait in a suburb? Or, like, if you lined up a bunch of paintings across a countryside, could they jump you know, just run through all the portraits to another country or whatever. Um, like, what's the limitation there? Like, is it like Bluetooth? <laughs> like, you need to be close enough where it still works? Like, what's the enchantment there? Um, what else was I thinking? I don't know. That's that's mostly everything, I think, that I was, I was thinking about. And it all stemmed from kind of like, who paints these portraits? And at what point do they come alive? Is it an enchantment after the, the fact? Or do they come alive as soon as it becomes clear enough that it's a thing like if you have a sketchy outline of a person and it starts to walk and talk like how do you finish it and then also if you're only let's just say it's an enchantment that you do after you paint the front of it you're painting it from like a two-dimensional whatever um how does the painting know what the back looks like <laughs> you know like if a person you only get the paint you only paint the front of it how does it know what the back looks like but yeah, I thought like living as a, a portrait after the fact would be better than living as a ghost. It's like allow yourself to to die and pass on and go on whatever um, that is. And then also be able to exist and talk to people and give advice after death as a portrait. Again, there's limitations to portraits too because it's like where wherever you're hung, you're kind of stuck unless there's other portraits or you have another portrait of yourself somewhere. Who paints these paintings? I want to know. If you know, let me know. What do you think? Have you thought about this? <laughs>
has this been explained and I just don't know? But yeah. So anyway, I did some little scritchy scratchy watercolors. Um, I'll take a picture so that way you can at least see what I just did. But yeah, just a quick little study of atoms. I definitely think acrylic is the way to go with dry brush. Watercolor just puts too much pigment. It's too much. Like even drying this off, it's putting too much and not enough. Like I don't know how to explain it. Just, I don't like it. Yeah. So that's all I've got for you today. I'd love to know what you think about the portraits in Harry Potter, like what you think, um, or if you've read something in some of the like Harry Potter lore. And then what do you think about like living as a ghost versus living as a, as a portrait? And by living, I mean, you know, like existing as a portrait or a ghost. If you're a Harry Potter fan, I'd like to know. <laughs> so I'll put a picture up on the screen now so that way you can see um, these kind of sketchy atoms that I just did and let me know what you think. I personally like these, um, like these ones with the uh, dry brush acrylic a lot more. I think it's giving me more of the fuzzy light vibe that I want. So I think I'll go back to doing that. But this was still a fun practice to do. So yeah, so make sure to like, subscribe, follow, do all the things. And I will see you next time. Bye.